in today's installment of my TV teardown. I separate completely an LCD from the backlight and keep it operational. So we can actually put content on this while the LCD is separated. And we're gonna look at the colors and where these colors come from in the TV. In this case, it's a combination of quantum dots and phosphors. So stay tuned. Today, we're gonna to take apart this TCL QLED TV. It's a five series. So let's start unboxing. So this is a brand new TCL TV. Uh, it's an S555. Manufacturing date, according to the TV, is in 2002. So I think it could be a 2003 model year TV. I'm not sure exactly. Um, it was actually purchased for under $500, maybe even under $400 at um, right around Super Bowl time. So that when the, some of those TV sales were going on for the Super Bowl. So this is a pretty good TV to get for less than $400. And it's a QLED TV, so it has quantum dots in it. We're going to take a look at uh, how those look in the TV. But first, we're going to get this TV set up on a stand so we can take a look at what it looks like from the front of the screen. So my hope in doing this is actually to keep this TV operational since it is a brand new, um, pretty nice TV. So we'll see if I can make it through this whole process without destroying it beyond repair, but we'll find out. So this has the Roku operating system. Um, it should be noted Roku also now is making their own TVs with quantum dots in it, but this is the TCL version of a, with a Roku operating system. So the first thing I like to do is take some measurements of the white spectrum at the front of the screen. So I use my handy dandy USB spectrometer. And one thing I notice here immediately is this peak in the red or multiple peaks in the red. This is pretty indicative of a phosphor called KSF developed by GE. And I also think there could be some green phosphor in here judging by the peak shape as well as quantum dots underneath these peaks. And we'll do some more analysis later and take a look at the phosphor compared to the quantum dots. So now that we've got that, we're gonna get the back panel off this TV. I've sped this up for you because taking up taking off all of these screws uh, is quite time consuming sometimes. I hope I've kept track of them well enough to get this put back together. So we'll get this back panel popped off and you'll see all the electronics underneath. And then really to get into the heart of this where the electronics then communicate with the LCD. We've got one more piece to take off here. I'm gonna remove this bottom bottom piece, and that also has the receiver for the uh, remote on it. But you can see now these kind of orange looking ribbon cables connected to a PCB. This is how um, all the electronics then communicate with the LCD. And this is a pretty fragile part that I've got to be careful of. You see there's two connection points there. I'm going to take off these speakers here because they kind of get in the way when I keep putting this over a few times. So we're going to disconnect these speakers. And then we're going to start to get into uh, putting the receiver, the IR receiver for the remote back on so that I can actually communicate with this TV even after I have the LCD separated. So I've got the TV flipped over now with the back casing on. And what I'd like to do is try to get the bezel off. Um, so I've got a heat gun and some tools here to do that. But in the meantime, I realized I probably should have unplugged the ribbon cables and get those out of the way so that when I do get this released, I don't damage the ribbon cable. So I'm going to try to do that now without flipping it back over, which might be challenging. But that cover is not on very tight, just a couple of screws. So I'm hoping I can, I should be able to pop off the PCB pretty easily. My worry is the clips on the ribbon cables. So I am able to successfully get off the PCB and disconnect it from the electronics and then pull it out. So you see it there on the left side. There were a few pieces of tape holding that PCB inside the TV so it doesn't move around too much. So here's a close up on the other half. Uh, I have to kind of get my fingernail on this clip to release the connector. And then peel on, and then pull back the ribbon cable, uh, or sorry, the, yeah, the, the ribbon cable that's connecting to it. And then the PCB doesn't flop forward. You'll see at this point, um, I still have to go in with a knife and kind of pry or 
cut loose a couple of pieces of tape that are holding that PCB on. It's putting a little more stress than I'd like on those um, those ribbon connectors there that are that are orange and bent there, you see, because um, those are kind of fragile, but you can see I am able to get it off. And um, I actually don't believe that I've damaged it in any way because you'll see I'm able to actually run some content into this in a few minutes here. Okay, so now we're going to see if we can start to warm up the adhesive here. And work the bezel loose. I'd love to be able to do this without damaging the LCD if I can. We shall see if that's possible. Looks like we're under it. I'm going to go very slowly working my way around here. The heat is definitely loosening up that uh, adhesive. My hope is it doesn't stick back behind me again. If it does, I'll stick something in between it. So we'll speed up here so this doesn't take forever. But I am able to very slowly go around and make sure this adhesive is loose on each side entirely before I move to the next one. You might notice some lighting differences here in this video. I'm trying out a new lighting approach, which I plan to make a, a YouTube video on on its own. It's kind of going back and forth here right now. I actually am using a torn down TV as a light source in my video here, which is kind of cool. But that's why you might see a little bit of funky lighting going on at times. I don't quite have it optimized yet. But you can see I can use some tools in the heat to work my way around very slowly. I would, did not crack any of the LCD as far as I can tell here. In, in prior videos, when I was working with a broken, a already broken TV or LCD, I found that the cracks would sort of propagate. But in this one, since it wasn't cracked, it was actually fairly robust. Um, you could bend this quite a bit. And you can see here how thin this LCD really is and, and what it looks like as we start to peek into the back. Now, I definitely recommend two people and gloves if you want to actually remove an LCD and maintain it. So here we're doing that. We're taking this LCD, flipping it over, and so now it's going to be face down on this piece of cardboard with some padding that I put on it. It's amazingly thin and flexible. Um, I was surprised at how much this could flex and still not break. You might be able to see that at times, how much we're actually this kind of bows. And then if we're going to run this, you know, we need to have the ribbon cables um, connected back to the LCD. So I had to do some propping up with this and getting the LCD lined up and the ribbon cables out of the back of the TV well enough, but did manage to do it. And so now we've got half of it set up here and then the other half of the ribbon cable connected. So we should be able to feed content now from the TV electronics into the LCD you know, as it would normally operate, but we actually can watch the two independently, the backlight unit and the LCD. So here we go. We fired up the TV. That's good news. That still works. So from the top, we've got the backlight lit up, connected to the LCD. The LCD is running right now, showing just the TCL home screen can't really see it from this side because we're looking from the inside of the TV, but I'm going to switch the camera around here and we'll look from the other side. So now we're going to look from underneath the TV and see what it looks like. You can see the home screen. And actually, you can tell it's kind of transparent. I poke my head over the top, you can see it. So this is pretty amazingly thin, this LCD. You can see my finger for scale there. 
It's about 1.6 microns thick as I've measured it, and that's outside the adhesive. Um, so it's not including that adhesive layer. Very thin where a lot of action is happening in these TBs. So now I'm going to lift this LCD up, and you noticed maybe in the background there that half the LEDs in the backlight were running. That's because I'm running content to this that's half black and half white. So on the left side, I'm running content that's uh, white, and on the right side, it's black. So it's totally open on the LCD on the left, totally closed on the right. You can see it was transparent with my hand waving behind it there. And on the right side, you can't see any hand behind it. So I've actually got a PowerPoint file here that I'm going to scroll through. And we'll look at what some of the colors then look like. So this is just simply changed to a red screen, um, a green screen, and a blue screen. And you'll see that it's just the LCD. The backlight isn't changing here. It's just white light coming out of the back. And just the LCD is changing these colors from red to green to blue. And even with some content running, you can see it's still semi-transparent. You can see my hand behind it there. And even as we set it down, still operational, and it's uh, it's pretty robust and amazing how well this how well this does. Now we'll try to see what this looks like as we switch sides. So I just have a triangle on it, and now you can see the triangle. You can kind of see right through from the back. You can sort of see my lighting setup there, which we'll get to in another video. And from an angle, I just want you to be able to see the backlight here. This is just a bright white screen. And as we change the LCD, that backlight isn't changing as long as the whole TV is lit up. As we put patterns on it, of course, that backlight changes because it does have full array local dimming. And we go to different colors here and some different patterns, and you can see it's just the LCD changing. So how is this actually working, the LCD that's so thin, uh, generating these colors? It works on the concept of polarized light, and I'm not going to go too deep into this. But basically, if you put polarized light into this liquid crystal, and then you can choose to turn the liquid crystal on or off, you can control whether it's going through the red, green, and blue subpixel. So in this picture, the blue is turned off, the red and green, it's letting light through. And so you can get um, any mixture of different colors that way. It's pretty amazing technology. So now I've taken a flashlight, and I'm going to shine this from the back through the TV. And you can see when it's open, it goes right through, but when it's black, it doesn't go through very well, but just a little bit does. And then, of course, as you go to different colors, it turns that white flashlight into whatever color the LCD is choosing to show, whatever color I've told it to show. So when it's black, you can see a little bit of light coming through. And this maybe highlights where LCDs are imperfect, that some light does get through from that backlight, even when you're telling it to show an absolute black. So now we're going to try to get this... Um support on the bottom off so that the films can come off a little bit easier. It looks like there's some tabs that I can pop out here, perhaps, to help remove this piece right here. And then all the optical films we should be able to pull out pretty easily. So let's get started. So as magical as the LCD is in its operation, I think the backlight unit is just as amazing in the technology that's in there. This is where all the light is generated. This is where, in many cases, the color is generated. And we're going to try to get into the back here and take a look at exactly how that happens. So I've got to pop off this little plastic um, retaining piece here that's keeping all these films from falling out the bottom of the TV. We still have the LCD connected here, although I'm not really running anything in it right now. So we've got that off, and now you can see this first optical film looks pretty similar to ones I've seen in the past. and some difficulty getting this off. Uh, There's some, some tabs on the top that kept it held in. It was kind of tucked in under the sides, but once I bent it and sort of lifted it out of the way, um, I could fold that out of the way and then get to the other films that were underneath it. There really was only one film, though. Um, so this was one flexible optical Stuck film, and then we film. get on to this rigid diffuser part. Slide this out a little bit. That helps. Yeah, not enough though. I can see the LEDs underneath at least now. Oh, there we go. Now we're coming out a little bit. I'll bring that up. Ah, yes. That right there, that's your quantum dot part.
This quantum dot part does not look like most of the other ones that I've taken apart. This is actually a newer product. It's an extruded part. It's very thick. It's incorporated within the diffuser, the quantum dots are, instead of being their own standalone optical film. So this thing's about 1.7 millimeters thick, and it, it's rigid. I mean, you can pick it up and very easily handle it. You can see that in the video. It's quite a thick optical part. So naturally, I shine my UV flashlight on it, and you see that beautiful quantum dot glow coming from inside that film. Seems to be sort of a sandwich layer where the inside has the glow and the quantum dots and the outside doesn't. And you can see some texture on that film too where it's acting as a diffuser. So we shine the UV flashlight on, you can see how it converts kind of what looks like the purple from the UV into white in the visible. And here's the emission spectrum from those quantum dots. We have a very pure red and green quantum dot emission, um, 20 to 23 nanometer peak width, so that implies a very narrow peak width for good color. And then we move on to the LEDs. So let's see what these LEDs have in store for us. As you can tell when you look at them, they are, uh, they appear to be white LEDs and not just blue. So I think there is some phosphor. We know that from measuring the front of screen spectrum. And as we turn these on, um, when you go close up to these, you kind of see an interesting artifact. I think this is just because I'm recording it on a phone, but you start to see this red stripe coming across the screen. It may have something to do with the phosphor that's in there, um, but I think it mostly has to do with the frequency the LEDs are blinking at that we can't really see and the frequency that my camera on my phone is recording at. So sometimes you see this, sometimes you don't. You don't see it in real life. Uh, to the naked eye, this is not visible at all. This is really just an artifact of the recording, but I thought it looked kind of cool. So we're going to measure the optical spectrum of these LEDs now and see what they have in store for us kind of know what to expect based on measuring at the front, but it is in fact both a red and green phosphor. The red phosphor is pretty clearly a phosphor called KSF, and the green phosphor is called Beta Cylon. Thanks to my friend Jonathan for helping me to positively identify the green phosphor. And so we have this mix of red and green in the backlight in the LED, but we also have the quantum dot part. So these spectrum are actually additive. They're both contributing to the color. And you can see that here as I add this three spectrum together, that the QD part and the LED sort of are additive and contribute to that black spectrum. So I thought I'd do some modeling here and take a measured just single pass spectrum of the LED and the diffuser and add in a weighted average that I could manually manipulate of the QD part and the phosphor. So when I do this, I can in theory start to measure how much light is coming from the phosphor, how much is coming from the QD. And in the green spectrum, I get about less than 10% from the QD and the remaining 90 plus percent from the phosphor. I want to stress that this may not account for all the light recycling in the backlight unit, and probably that would boost up the contribution from the quantum dot part. Now in the red channel, this is about three quarters phosphor and one quarter quantum dot. Um, and you can tell that that baseline sort of moves up from the normal KSF spectrum and that gap between 610 and 630, that's where the QD is contributing there. So now I'm feeding content from a laptop into the TV via an HDMI, and I've got a PowerPoint file with different shapes on it, and we'll compare it um, to the picture here. So this is just an all black screen. All the LEDs turn off for that. And this is a white triangle on a black background. And then a white square a black square with a white background. You can see it only lights up the perimeter LEDs. And then half white, half black. And then we move to colored screens, a red screen, the green screen, and the blue screen, which really don't change very much, nor does it. So now I'm gonna feed into this backlight a local dimming test pattern. Now it's running on the LCD too, but you can't see it. And you're going to see uh, these LEDs are kind of grouped in groups of four. And that means there's 30 zones because there's 120 LEDs. That's pretty coarse local dimming in this TV. And you can see the pattern sort of moving around as these groups of four LEDs move from right to left on the screen. And then you'll actually see where I start to mouse over on the right side here. You can see my mouse moving uh, in little circles on the screen. That's just the color of the white mouse and uh, lighting up the LEDs in the back. Believe it or not, I am going to try to get this thing put back together, but that's going to have to hold off for another video. Thank you for watching.